Hey, how's it going, guys? And welcome to another episode of Real Me In Colon A Movie Podcast, where we talk about anything and everything that involves movies. And, you know, it's it's kind of like a, you know, you didn't really ask for it, but I'm going to go ahead and just give it to you anyways. Uh, it's kind of like a, uh, when you buy like a loaf of bread and you walk away for like a week and you come back and there's like that little piece of mold at the bottom of the loaf. Yeah. So I just compared my show to a piece of mold on a loaf of bread. This week's episode is... The top 10 movies of 2013. Now, I have a guest along with me, and it is uh, Jackson. He's one of my good buddies. And uh, Jackson, how are you doing today? Um, I'm doing all right. Thanks for having me back, man. No problem. We are uh, we are both going to discuss our top 10s. This is how it's going to go. Uh, we're going to do six through, or 10 through 6 first. Uh, sorry, my dyslexia just kicked in. 10 through 6 first, uh, we'll each go, and then we'll do a 5 through 2, and then we'll have our top movies of 2013. Uh, I will go ahead and start this one off, and um, I have some honorable mentions. I'm going to just uh, list them off, uh, don't, not really discuss them. We have Mandela, Rush, Philomena, Lone Survivor, and This is the End. Those are my uh, honorable mentions, so all right, the gloves are off. Let's do it. Number 10. Dallas Buyers Club. This movie is it, the acting is incredible. It, if if there's something that you don't really like about the movie, you you can't just sit there and say the acting was terrible because Matthew McConaughey, this guy is amazing. Like I've always said it from like early uh, 2000s, even like the 1990s. Like the guy, the guy is like a, a great actor. So. Uh, Dallas Buyers Club pretty much like solidifies that Matthew McConaughey is just fantastic, and Jared Leto, that that guy, he well, first of all, he looks like a transvestite. I mean, but but it's okay. Um, his part's really good too. Like like I, like I said, the reason this movie is at number ten is because the acting is so impeccable and so grounded, and you can tell uh, McConaughey and Leto both really really got a hold of their characters, and I really appreciate that. Number nine, I'm going to go with Before Midnight. Uh, This is the third movie in the Before trilogy, so Before Sunrise in 1995, Before Sunset 2004, and Before Midnight 2013. This movie to me was more, like, it felt like a good conclusion. I know it's it's probably not going to be a conclusion because this did kind of leave a cliffhanger, but it was nice to see the progression of the relationship go from the first movie to the third movie. Um, I actually watched all three in the same night, thanks to uh, Mr. Uh, Adam Bilbrey at The Modern Film Critic. He actually turned me to all three of them. And Adam, I fucking thank you. <laughs> I, I really loved all three of those movies. And Before Midnight, was just fan- it was like a nice little cap uh, to their relationship. And it just gets... W- it just got worse as their uh, their relationship went on, and it's just well written. And just Ethan Hawke, man, like yeah, he was in the shit box getaway, but uh, you know he does good movies like Before Midnight, and you can forgive him. Uh, so Before Midnight is at number nine for me. Number eight is Gravity. This movie, if you if you hated the movie, I'm I'm okay with that. You but you cannot sit there and deny by saying the visual effects they pretty much like. Uh, they made their stance in cinema. Like, they, they pretty much showed every single movie up by saying, hey, look at our visual effects. We are badass. And that's what that movie was. The visual effects were out of this world, and I, I wanted to win uh, the Oscar for visual effects. And the movie, yeah, the script is not, like, the best in the world. But the reason why this is on my list at number eight is because Gravity is such an intense thrill ride. That's all it is, is an intense thrill ride. And I haven't sat in a theater in a long time where I felt like I was literally in space, like trying to dodge and weave with Sandra Bullock in her suit with her. Um, but that didn't happen though. Uh, I just lied to you, but uh, it, it's just a great thrill ride. And if you haven't seen gravity in a theater, that's where it should be seen the most. Number seven is prisoners. This, this to me felt like a perfect movie and I'm going to go and explain why I thought everything like meshed together. I thought the acting was superb. Hugh Jackman and Jake Gyllenhaal killed it in their roles. I thought the cinematography was beautiful. Roger Deakins, that man, is like a legend. Um, If you guys saw Skyfall last year, he shot that one. He shot basically almost every Coen Brother movie you can think of. But 
uh, along with the cinematography, the 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 score and like the haunting, like disturbing tone of it was also good. <clears throat> and I thought the story was really intense and it kept you on on edge the entire time. And I thought like in that regard, it was a a a perfect movie because I I saw it as a a movie that worked on all parts of film. Like it just you know came together, worked worked so well. All right, <clears throat> to round off my uh, number six is Mud. This is another Matthew McConaughey movie, and you can tell that this is his year. I saw Mud back in May, and I was surprised in the terms of the writing and how well the story was constructed together and how, how simple it was, but at the same time, you were still engaged with the characters. It still kept you on edge. It still surprised you, and that's what that's the highest praise for Mud is, the, is this story, and McConaughey is great, but... He is not the best part. It is Ty Sheridan, the main character. He is, I uh, forgot how old he is, but he is definitely smaller than me, so he is not my age. But he, he does a very impressive job. The acting and writing is fantastic in Mud. It's a great uh, just story, great thrill ride. Mud is my number six. Jackson, take it away for uh, 10 through 6 with you, bud. Well, um, I, I should just mention uh, uh, he is 17. I just looked it up. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> so uh, actually, uh, first I'll, I'll say that there are a few I didn't see, so they're not going to be on my list. I didn't see The Act of Killing, All is Lost, American Hustle, Blackfish, The Great Beauty, Saving Mr. Banks, The Spectacular Now, or The Way, Way Back. Those might be on my list if I ever see them, but they're not right now. Um, so there, are, this was a very good year, and there were a lot of uh, films that, that did not make my list that I did really like, and those would be Fruitvale Station, the Hunt, Inside Lewin Davis, Is the Man Who Is Tall, Happy, Gravity, Prisoners, and The Selfish Giant. Um, but what did make my list, um, number 10, actually, would be Mud. Uh, Mud, my first experience with Jeff Nichols as a director was with Take Shelter, which I thought was a phenomenal movie. And Mud, it, it's, it's great because there's this very very raw realness to it but at the same time it almost has this fairy tale quality to it uh you know the just the simple fact just the fact that it deals with with mcconaughey as this sort of elusive creature almost like a unicorn or a uh <laughs> or no, like no. A, you're right like his his character was treated like you know like a like that like he lived on that island and it was pretty much like never heard of from any any of the community at all. Yeah, I mean, he may as well he may as well have been I don't even know like a troll or something because <laughs> the, there was there was this there was this fairy tale quality to it where he was this sort of mythical beast and um, and that's what I really really liked about it. I thought McConaughey's performance, as you said, this is his year. Uh, I thought his performance was fantastic, um, and, and Ty Sheridan for a kid actor. Very, very good. Yeah, uh, Reese Witherspoon was solid. Um, not enough Michael Shannon, but but for the most part, yeah, this is a great, great movie, and I uh, definitely recommend checking it out. Um, my number nine is a German language film called Lore. Um, it is about this teenage girl named Lore, uh, who's played very well by this actress named Saskia Rosendahl, and so she, her parents were Nazi sympathizers in World War II. They live in Germany, and so. At, at the end of World War II, they are being brought on trial, and <clears throat> Germany's sort of taken over at this point. Uh, it's being occupied by Russians. It's being occupied by all the Allied forces, and and Lore has to basically take her, uh, take her um, her younger siblings to her grandmother's house somewhere on the other side of Germany, and it's this whole voyage, and she meets this young Jewish boy, and he sort of, she, he sort of makes her question everything that she was raised believing. Uh, it's, 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 a good, it's a good film because, A, it shows that even the good guys in war are not the most, they're not really good guys. Yeah. And <clears throat> also, just, just seeing her sort of transform into this person who is much more tolerant and, and just a much better person by the end of this uh, journey. It was a really, really fantastic film. It's on Netflix Instant Streaming if you haven't seen it. Um, 
So that's my number nine. Number eight is The Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there you go, I, bud. I really dug this movie. Uh, for three hours, for the most part, it held my attention. I did start to drift off a little bit towards the end. or It started to lose me a little bit towards the end. But this is an energetic movie. It is stylish. It is funny as all hell. Leonardo DiCaprio's performance in this is probably one of his best, if not his best. There's a certain level of physical comedy that he achieves that reminds me of Jim Carrey, let's say. And it's a really, it's, it's, a, it's just a really impressive movie. And there has been controversy, people saying that it glorifies the, the, the actions of this character. But I don't think you could make a more scathing indictment of these kinds of activities than you could with the Wolf of Wall Street. Um, Jonah Hill, also spectacular. He has a very, the, the dynamic between them is very much like a De Niro and Pesci dynamic, where if this movie was made back, you know, during the De Niro era of Scorsese's filmography, uh, that's who you would see playing these roles. You would see Pesci in the Hill role, and you would see De Niro in the DiCaprio role. Uh, and I mean, there's a ton of supporting actors. You have, was it Margot Robbie as the, the wife, and she's great yeah. as the, the second wife. Um, although Christi, Kristen Milioti is the first wife, is great too. She plays the mother on How I Met Your Mother. Uh, Matthew McConaughey shows up. Jean Dujardin shows up. Uh, uh, Rob Reiner's great as his father. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and uh, John Favreau shows up as their lawyer briefly. It's just, it's a really, really entertaining movie. Uh, don't take the kids to it because it's three hours of just debauchery but <laughs> yeah. it is a great three hours of debauchery yes um my number seven is nebraska so for me alexander payne is very hit or miss i haven't seen citizen ruth i haven't seen election i didn't like about schmidt and i i really liked sideways and i didn't like the descendants i don't think he's a great writer i think when he writes he starts off very strong and then his he sort of devolves into these character stereotypes and these cheap jokes um, but, but Nebraska, he didn't write, he only directed, and he's a great director. Nebraska has a great, great script by, I think the guy's name is Bob Nelson. Bruce Dern, fantastic. I hope Bruce Dern wins the Oscar for best actor. Um, he's certain to get nominated. Will Forte, SNL, from SNL, uh, uh, he's very good. Bob Odenkirk's in there. Stacey Keach is in there. Uh, and it's, it's shot in this gorgeous black and white. Um, it's, it's a really good father son bonding movie as they sort of discover certain things about each other that they didn't know before. I, I absolutely loved it. Oh, and of course, June Squibb, best supporting actress. She's got to get nominated. She is funny as hell in this movie. Um, I adored her. And number six is Captain Phillips. So I never really liked Tom Hanks as an actor very much. I always thought he was kind of over the top, but here he is phenomenal. There's a certain bit in the movie where he's in this medical bay, and it is such insanely good acting. It's I was not expecting that level of quality from him. This is an intense movie. It, it the shaky cam's a little bit much, but it, it's a really, really gripping, thrilling movie. Even if you know how the story is going to end, and yes, the movie's not accurate to how events actually happened. I don't care. It's a movie. Yeah. It's a movie separated from from the from the true story and um I think I think also I liked it has this feeling of isolation. It, it very much is like gravity in a sense because you are sort of in the middle of nowhere uh stuck with these problems. Of course they're two very different problems, but they both carry that central theme of isolation and that theme of isolation is what drives the fear and the intensity of the film. They're the primary they're the primary engine of what makes those movies so good. Yeah. Um, so that was my that was my ten through six. Okay, that's a very good list uh, there, Jackson. I was I just want to preface to everyone out there: uh, don't shoot me, but uh, I did not see Captain Phillips, Inside Lewin Davis, American Hustle, Nebraska, and All Is Lost. I think those are like the only ones I didn't see. So I apologize, but you know I'm only human. Um, so. I'm going to give you my five through two right now, and uh, let's begin. At number five is Short Term 12. Now, I walked into this movie, and I didn't know anything about it. 
And I was pleasantly surprised on how simple the movie was in terms of the acting, the writing, the way it's shot, the way it's put together. It felt like a movie you would see in film school, but it was so good. That's what makes it so special to me is that <clears throat> it you can you can tell it's a small film, but by God, it it just exceeds on higher higher levels than you can think. Like Brie Larson is in it. Uh, she was the blonde from Twenty One Jump Street. She's fantastic in this movie. Uh, and everyone else, I, I, I don't know any of the other actors' names, but they all did a fantastic job. Like I said, it's a simple story, but if you if you find it anywhere, like please for love of God, check it out. Short Term yeah. Twelve at number five. That was one of the ones that I that I missed this year, unfortunately. It's it's pretty good. Uh, I, I yeah, like I said, it was just very surprising on how small of a movie it was, but it was it, it, it exceeded greater than what it was presented. Um, and number four is 12 Years a Slave. Uh, this movie, basically in a nutshell, will hit you in the stomach. It will rip out your insides, tear them out, and like the person tearing them out will chew them up and like spit them out in your face. Steve what McQueen, I know, it's, 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 pretty, it's, That's it's pretty violent. Uh, Steve McQueen directs this movie, and he, uh, uh, he directed Shame two years ago. And Shame was fantastic with Michael Fassbender. So over... Uh, over, uh, yeah, it was very underrated at the Oscars. And he directs 12 Years of Slave with Michael Fassbender in it, but it's also got Chiwetel Ejiofor as the main character. You got Brad Pitt, um, Benedict Cumberbatch, Paul Dano, Paul Giamatti. Everyone kills it in this movie. And Fassbender is one of the most despicable, disgusting assholes I have ever seen on film. He's up there. And this movie, it just, it makes you feel like shit. I'm, it will, it does. Like, it just makes you feel like crap, and you just, like, you want to go take a nap afterwards and, like, you know, sleep off the uh, the stomach problems that you're having. So, uh, 12 Years a Slave is a hard one to get through, but it is a damn good movie in terms of acting, cinematography, just the overall direction. Really intense story. Loved it. Number yeah. three, The Place Beyond the Pines. Let me tell you about this movie. I saw this movie in March, and I said, this is my number one of the year. And, you know, it's in the top three, but it stayed on my list that long. You want to know why? Because this movie, it it, it was different. It, it was presented in such a different way, you you did not know it was going to go that way. You, you see the trailer, and it's like, oh, it's a typical drama about their father and sons. No. This movie is a Pass the Torch movie, where it's got three different acts, like, distinctly. Like, they're th- like they feel like three short stories, but they're all tied in together. And so that's what I really liked about it. Is it was surprising. It was well written, well acted, and it just kept you interested because yeah. you want you wanted to see where these characters went and how they, uh, you know, just what the events they they've done, like what they lead to, because it does tie in all together. And that's what I really like about it. Ryan yeah, Gosling's in it. Uh, what were we gonna say? Uh, I was gonna say it's 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 really more about the town itself. I mean, the place yeah. beyond the pines. Uh, is the translation of a Native American? It's, it is the translation of the name of the town, Schenectady, which is in in I don't know what what Native American tongue, but it means the place beyond the pines. It's about the city and these sort of stories that happen very much in a way like um, uh, uh, what's New York stories or Paris to Tim or yeah. or you know all those sorts of things. Yeah, it, it 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 really is about the town and like the characters in it and how they're so diverse with each other and but it it's just great uh, in in terms of that and I'm telling you, man, Ryan Gosling, I've always liked this guy and he just it's like with Leonardo DiCaprio, they just fucking hate him. But Bradley Cooper's also in it. Dane DeHaan, he's always badass, and it's directed by Derek C. In France, who did Blue Valentine in 2010, which was one of my favorites that year. And Place Beyond the Pines is up there too like this guy's on fire he's gonna become the one of the next big directors I, i'm already calling it all yeah, right i i gotta say the way it was marketed i i like you said before i had no idea what kind of movie or i had an i had a conception of what i had an idea of what kind of movie it was gonna be when i went in because uh, the trailers don't even touch on that third act of the film yeah i had no idea that was even in there exactly I, I i assumed it was this sort of cat and mouse thing with cooper chasing gosling but it's 
It's so much different than that. It's not on my top ten. I didn't love it. I liked it. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah. Um, there's there's definitely a lot to love in this movie. Exactly. Um, at the very least, it is ambitious as hell. Oh no, for sure. It like it it it's different. Like that. That's another reason why I liked it because it felt fresh. It's um, almost as if, it's almost as if the, the the plot structure would be like if you untied Pulp Fiction and just sort of laid them out in the events that they happened. Yeah. The events in the order that they happened. Yeah. That would be the plot structure of of uh, Place Beyond the Pines. Yeah, I, I I totally agree with that. Um, so for all right, boys and girls, this is the we're getting to like some really deep territory. Uh, this is my number two pick, The Wolf of Wall Street. I saw this movie two days ago, and this movie blew me away in terms of just everything. And what I want to address is like what you were saying, like uh, you kind of got like lost in the third act, not the third act, but like towards the tail end. My my whole thing was I understand what they were doing, and I thought it worked worked really well in the terms of uh, as an audience member, you felt like you were on this like cocaine ride with the main character, and then once he got hit into reality, when uh, at the very end, like you felt like that low with him, like you felt like you were coming off your high and you were getting back to reality. I think that's why I liked it so much because we were on that ride with him, and then holy shit, we were hit with reality like right there. And I think that's what really worked for me. I love Scorsese. I love the death, and I also love Leonardo DiCaprio. Just like you said, it's probably one of the best performances he's ever given. Like, hands down. And, like, Matthew McConaughey is in there for, like, 15 minutes. But, you know, he's always awesome. And then uh, Jonah Hill, just that guy, man. Like, he's got some diversity under his belt. But Wolf of Wall Street is, like, it's like you said. It's like a crazy three-hour debauchery ride. But you love it. And you want to see more of it. Uh, When I was over with, it's three hours long. I wanted to see three more hours. And it's just a crazy-ass movie. But it is so engaging in the fact that we as audience members love to see filth like hands down we do we like to see filth and we want to see more of it and if if it's presented like this i'm totally fine with that and for me it was just a fun crazy funny depressing ride at the same time it was awesome so that's uh, my number two short term 12 and number five 12 years of slave number four place beyond the pines at number three and wolf of wall street number two jackson take it away from five through two all right um so my number five is her uh this one actually kind of bounced around my top 10 because it's a movie that I had some issues with it, uh, particularly with some of the humor I thought was very juvenile. But this is such a profound and beautiful love story. Uh, what makes it work so well, Scarlett Johansson is great in, as as the OS, Samantha. And actually, originally she was voiced by Samantha Morton. And that's who Joaquin Phoenix, was, who's also great, was interacting with. And then they had Scarlett Johansson record over it because in uh, post-production, he did, uh, Spike Jones didn't like the way that Morton's voice sounded in the film. So Johansson doesn't have anyone to work off of, and she, or at least she's not working off of Phoenix, but it feels like th- that connection is so there. It's, and, and by the end, you really do fall in love with this OS as well. It's, there are parts that got me choked up, and I am not the kind of person to get choked up. It is has a great song, the Moon Song, in it that that High Hope gets nominated for Best Original Song. It's just a really, really beautiful film. And it's also very grounded, too. It's science fiction, but it's not so far ahead in the future. This looks like a future that we could see in the next decade or so. Yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, someone falling in love with, with artificial intelligence, it's, it's believable. And it's such a great, great, great movie. And I'm not even a huge Spike Jones fan, and I loved it. Loved her. Yeah. Um, number four is 12 Years a Slave, just like yours. Nice. I mean, arguably the most important film released this year. Yeah. It is an unflinching look at slavery. It is not Hollywoodized. In no. In any way, shape, or form, Steve McQueen directs this simultaneously with the delicacy of a seamstress, but also with the sheer blunt force of a sledgehammer. Yeah. And somehow he sort of dances that line between how do I handle this delicately, but also, you know, delicately in a way that I don't make any sort of, I, I, it doesn't seem like I'm trying to profit off of slavery in any way or, or, you know, use it for entertainment value, but also, 
you know, how do I show the audience the true brutal horrors? Performances are amazing. Fastbender, edgy of four standouts. Yeah. Uh, not much else to say. You pretty much covered it. Um, number three is a documentary called Cutie and the Boxer. It is mm. about an older couple uh, of artists that moved from Japan, and it's about them trying to make ends meet selling their work. It's a very, very uh, profound movie. And, and what's so great is they... It's, it's cinema verite, truth cinema at its finest, because they... They, they, this couple acts like there's no camera around. You really get the feeling that this is what their life is like. They're so comfortable around the camera and, and just these random conversations they had. They have a whole conversation about how Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull is like the worst movie they've ever seen. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a wonderful documentary. It's very touching, at times even heartbreaking. Uh, it's on Netflix if you would like to see it. It's only about an hour and 20 minutes, but it really, it really is just one of the Best. It's the best documentary I've seen this year, uh, and that's my number three. Number two is another controversial film, uh, Blue is the Warmest Color. Nice. Um, this has some very gratuitous sex scenes, uh, but it's, it's, they don't detract from the film in any way. The performances are great, and it doesn't treat, it doesn't treat this, this girl's sexual orientation as a gimmick in any way. It's not... It's not, hey, this girl becomes gay. It's, hey, this girl falls in love with someone, and that person happens to be another woman. It's, it, it, it's just, it's a really, really beautiful film. It's a long movie. It's three hours long, but I definitely recommend seeing it. Uh, it's just, it's so good. And it won, it won the Golden Palm at the Cannes Film Festival. I mean, what more do you really need? Yeah. Uh, so that was my – so, again, five her, four 12 years of slave, three cutie in the boxer, two blue is the warmest color. All right, Jackson, are you ready, buddy? We're going to do yeah. a number one pick. All right, so – Can I guess yours? Can I guess yours? Uh, go ahead. What is it? Smurfs 2. Oh, you know what? I wanted to put the Lone Ranger, but I swapped it out with Mur- Smurfs 2 at the, the last moment because I just – I love little blue people. Uh, anyways, that's really awkward. So, uh, uh, all right. So my number one, my, my number one pick for 2013, everyone is the spectacular. Now this movie is, it spoke to me in a way where like, I didn't get to enjoy this in high school, but I wish I did. It's about, it's very simple. It's from the writers of 500 days of summer. And it's about two people in high school just having their relationship. And then they part ways, you know, when they graduate, but it spoke to me because I, I could relate to it a whole lot. And I thought the the acting was spectacular. Miles Teller, like he I like when he does serious stuff, not stupid comedies. I like uh James Poinsall as the the director. He was fantastic. Uh and the way it was shot, it felt like a nineties movie. So everything about that just it just spoke to me. And I really, really, really enjoy Spectacular now and you should check it out. Jackson, what is your number one pick? So my number one pick is Upstream Color, directed by Shane Carruth. You can find it on Netflix. It is a really great science fiction uh, uh, romance, sort of. It's about these people, and they get these parasites, and the parasites are transplanted into pigs, and sort of whatever happens to the pigs happens to them. And it's hard, it's a hard movie to explain. It can be very confusing. Carruth's last movie, Primer, was a very dense, dense time travel movie, but it no one has done time travel as as well as he has. Um, just in terms of ex- how they execute the actual concept. It's, it's, it's a very, very, it's a beautiful movie. It's got an amazing soundtrack. He is the director, producer, writer. He does the score. He stars in it. He's the editor. This man does everything. When you want to talk about auteur theory, you know, who owns a film, whose film, you know, you know, does it belong to the director, writer, whatever, or does it belong to everyone? His movies are truly auteur films because he does everything. Yeah. Um, it's a really magnificent film. Watch it. Make sure you're not tired because you need to pay attention. But I, when I got out of the theater, I was just in awe. And a lot of people walked out, but at the very least, you cannot say that it's not an interesting, unique movie. Um, so yeah, that's my number one, Upstream Color. And actually, we're just about running out of time. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I, w- I was just going to wrap it up saying uh, uh, thanks for joining, everyone. And that was our top uh, 10. And for Jackson, it's Upstream Color is number one. For me, it's a spectacular now. Go check both those movies out. Uh, just um, wanna... Can I plug my Twitter? Go ahead. At Jackson Shrout, J-A-C-K-S-O-N-S-H-R-O-U-T. One word, just at Jackson Shrout. Uh, thank you for having me on again.
Uh, no problem. And uh, make sure you follow him, guys, and make sure you follow me at Real Chase Lee. Uh, Facebook, uh, Real Reviews with Chase Lee, and uh, YouTube, youtube.com slash Shabutnik75, capital S, lowercase H-A-B-O-T-N-I-K, 75. We want to thank you guys. Uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Goodbye. Bye.